Welcome back, geologists, and we're here for part two of geologic time. So we're going to be looking more in depth at absolute dating and how that applies to the geologic time scale. So let's get started. So absolute dating techniques are used by collecting certain types of rocks in the field. The most dependable ones are igneous rocks, and uh, specifically lava flows are really good, like this one right here, Bonita Lava Flow in uh, Arizona, which is where Sunset Crater is, right outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. The reason is, is molten rocks cool and crystallize the radioactive parent atoms, causing them to separate uh, from previously formed daughter atoms. So you kind of get a fresh clock is what happens. This allows us to measure the time of crystallization and not the time of formation of the radioactive atoms. That's important because rocks can change in and out of the rock cycle as you learned in physical. So we want to measure the new point that these rocks are made in time, which is the recrystallization or the crystallization point. In the case of this uh, lava that you see here, once the rock crystallized, that's its starting clock moment. That's why igneous rocks are the best. Sedimentary rocks, however, are the worst choice for dating. Um, while these rocks may be beautiful and I can put an age to them because we can look at uh, fossils in them, it's a lot harder to absolutely or to use absolute dating techniques to date this rock right here because sedimentary rocks uh, have uh, just minerals and hodgepodge of other things stuck together. We can't measure when the minerals were deposited. We can only measure when the minerals were formed. So that's why sedimentary rocks are much harder to date than something like igneous and even metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks pose a challenge as well because if you apply too much heat and pressure, then you pretty much lose your clock. So igneous rocks are always your best bet if you have something. So what will happen is that if there are igneous rocks below and above these layers, then we can age date the actual um, sedimentary rocks by process of elimination by looking at the ages of the igneous below and above. So obtaining an accurate closed system is critical to doing radiometric dating. What that means is a closed system is where a rock uh, has neither parent or daughter atoms that have been added or removed from the system since it initially crystallized. For example, you're looking at this uh, pink granite uh, right there. That's important because if we don't have anything added or deleted from the time this crystallized, the rock is in its format almost as if it clocked in and it stayed the same since uh, it initially formed. This means that the ratio between the daughter and the parent uh, isotopes uh, will produce a very dependable radioactive decay ratio. And that will help us uh, narrow the scope of the actual accurate geologic time for that rock. So collecting an absolute date on a rock requires a, a multiple step process. The first step is to go collect the rock from the field. The second one is to bring it into a lab. And essentially what you would do is take a cross uh, section, you'd shave some of that rock off, and then you would put it into uh, either a powder or liquid form and in a clean room setting and then you would run it through a scanning electron microscope or a mass spec. Uh, you would run it through a mass spectrometer and then that would tell you uh, more information about what you need to determine the age of that rock. Unfortunately in that process you can get leakage of an atom which causes the age date calculation to be off. So that's why there's usually a give or take plus or minus amount of years on the geologic time scale and why we don't get too upset about it being just perfectly on target for it is XYZ year like 1,552,000 years. We, no, it's, it's not going to happen that way. It's a relative date with absolute dating techniques applied. If the daughter atoms have been removed, the determined age will be too young. And if the parents... Um, uh, atoms have been removed, the determined age will be too old. So leakage can occur during metamorphism, extreme heat, pressure, or contamination. So we want to be sure that we keep a closed system and that we have no leakage of atoms during the process of, uh, of analyzing that rock. 
So when you select the material to be dated, uh, it requires geologists to use a clean sample, non-contaminated, that's not been subjected. Uh, when we do this process with the rock, it requires that the geologists select a clean sample. Not only does that mean it needs to be uh, clean in the sense of how you collect it and how you analyze it, it also needs to be clean in the sense that it's not undergone some extreme high temperature change or pressure change, which kind of knocks metamorphic rocks out of the equation that are moderate and high metamorphic rocks because they've often gone some form of change like recrystallization. So this enhanced technological advance in this field has really improved the ability of geologists to find the true age of rocks at a much higher precision rate than in the past. This may be surprising, but here's the precision rate figure. Less than 0.5% of the rocks age. That's how close we are with that's the variable uh, offness of the age. If it's 0.5% off, that's pretty remarkable. So I could date these armor plates of phytosaurs and adiosaurs within 0.5% of their actual age date. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? The end result is this. This means that a rock that's 150 million years old, like this rock you see over here, which is the Navajo sandstone from Jurassic, would have a possible error of margin ranging from 2.7 million years to less than 540,000 years. While that may sound like a huge amount of time to us as humans, you have to look at the span of the Earth's history being almost 4.6 billion years old. So that's pretty darn close. And you begin to realize that we have made the big wow of improvement of dating the geologic time scale as a consequence. So once radiometric dating and isotopic dating uh, became refined, the geologic time scale uh, kind of got a, a facelift and it got revitalized based on this new technology and data where we could date rocks across the globe and come up with more precise numbers. That goes back to my initial uh, preface at the very beginning of the lecture is one of the reasons why the time scale is constantly in a state of change. New discoveries, new age dating discoveries, new fossils, new rocks, new outcrops, things that we discover that help us refine the geologic time scale. So there are a couple of important isotopic pairs, and there's so many that we could cover. But I'm just going to do four of them right now, and I think that they're fair game for test. And here's why, because you need to understand that we're trying to paint a picture of big time clocks versus the standard one that everybody has a conception that all radiometric dating occurs, which is carbon-14. So let's start with uranium-238. That's the parent isotope. So after a half-life, it turns into lead-203. The half-life of that particular uh, parent isotope is 4.5 billion years. So you think about that. Hmm. That means it's going to be effective for dating rocks that are at about 10 million years of age to rocks that are 4.6 billion years of age. That's going to be a super choice for even meteorites that came from the origins of our solar system. Rubidium-87 to strontium-87 has a half-life of 48.8 billion years. Well, how do we know that? No one's been around for this light length of time, right? Obviously, we can look at the ratio of decay and put a mathematical equation to it. It produces the same effective range of dating as uranium-238 does. Potassium-40 to argon-40 is a very commonly used uh, half-life, and it produces a half-life of 1.3 billion. So it does rocks really well from about 100,000 years old to up to 4.6 billion years of age. Now carbon-14 is completely different. Carbon-14 is organic, so it's just going to decay itself until there's no more there. And the general about half-life of this is 5,730 years, which means I can't really use it for anything older than 70,000 years. By then, I've just about lost all of my carbon-14 dating availability in a sample. So carbon-14 is not going to be used for something like a trilobite or an ammonite, but it could be used for mammoth. could be used for a hominid that died... Um, 
at a, a crime scene five days ago. We could use it for something uh, like a saber-toothed cat that died 12,000 years ago, or a woolly rhinoceros that died uh, 60,000 years ago, but anything that's over 70,000, not going to work. It's just, not, it's just too old, and uh, you're just not going to have enough carbon to make it work. So carbon-14 has three isotopes, C12, C13, C14. When something dies, no more C14 is replenished by uh, the atmosphere because this is a process that happens from solar radiation. So the ratio of C14 to C12 is reduced as C14 decays back into nitrogen. When this happens, C14 is the only unstable isotope of the carbon family and it has an approximate half-life of 5,730 years, plus or minus 30 years. So sometimes you'll get this other numbers if you look online, and they'll be different from the 5,730 years. That is the general accepted isotopic half-life for carbon-14. So remember, you can't date uh, carbon-14 for anything older than 70,000 years. So if I was looking at this rock right here, this is um, nice that is from the Cretaceous period. It's out near Sequoia National Forest. And let's say there was a, a fossil in here. There's no way I could date it. It's just too old. And it's not even the rock, right rock type to be dating with carbon-14. I would need to be using something like the uraniums or the potassium. <laughs> it's just not going to be the right fit for it. So you have to choose the right isotopic clock in order to date rocks. So what are some challenges of absolute dating? The law of inclusion states that anything that's uh, included in a rock, like a, an inclusion from another rock, must by definition be older than the rock that it's in. And since this occurs, we know that if there's grains in sandstone, or in this case, we got a, a granite, the individual grains that make this up are going to be older than the rock itself. This means the sandstone cannot be radiometrically dated. So, um, however, specific minerals in the rocks may be able to be looked at for isotopically being dated. So we need to understand that there are some challenges and limitations, and again, you can't take just one clue and put the whole picture together and make an assumption. You have to look at the comprehensive, holistic view of the clues to make an educated, scientific conclusion. Absolute ages for sedimentary rocks are typically derived by looking at the rock layers above and below that are igneous and sometimes low-grade metamorphic rocks. So if a dike crosses over a sedimentary layer, we can age date that. We know it's younger than what it crossed over from the law of cross-cutting relationships. Thus, the dike gives a minimum age for the host rock, which would be the sedimentary rock, and a maximum age for the layer of the rock above the formation. So if I had, let's say this is from King, uh, Kings Canyon, which is right near Sequoia National Forest or Park, if you were to age date dikes of this nature, this granite that crossed over some of the sedimentary rocks that were above it, then we would know that this is, uh, we could age date this and kind of put a bottom age and a top age. So it's like putting a sandwich age and putting the sedimentary rock in between the two. So determining absolute time has allowed us to give us a dual approach to making a geologic time scale. The advancement of this technology in the 20th century gave a jump start to making accurate assessments of the time scale, which I might add is still in a process of transition. And that process will continue to transition as long as we get new data. So who decides how the time scale works? This is kind of interesting stuff. The International Commission on Stratigraphy. Guaranteed test question. They generally set the scale boundaries, the scale length. Now they report to a bigger organization that is called the International Union of Geological Sciences. So if there are major changes, the IUGS approves it before the ICS puts it into the time scale. Then the individual countries have their own versions of the International Commission on Stratigraphy in North America is no exception to the rule. And generally, USGS, United States Geological Survey, is what pretty much sets the boundaries for North American timescales. 
So the time scales can uh, be different all over the globe, and that's why if you do an internet search for geologic time scales, it can almost send you to the funny farm looking at all the different dates and times and starts and finishes of periods and names because um, certain countries recognize Carboniferous, others don't. Uh, start and finish times will be different based on data that's collected, but generally it's this group right here, International Commission on Stratigraphy, that sets that. So that leads us into talking about how we achieve the current geologic time scale. Subdivisions of the time scale are based on very specific criteria and not just absolute dates and ages. The absolute date and ages were actually added later after the events kind of correlated the necessary divisions. So these are not the cumulative list of what could occur, but here's some examples of what you might uh, think of as causes for a different period, a different era. Obviously, changes in fauna. So fauna refers to life in terms of uh, animals and organisms and flora for plants. So if you got assemblages of fossils that radically change, evolve, or go extinct, then you could definitely qualify that as a need for a change in a geologic period. Another common cause of needing to change would be some major geologic event, such as a collision against a continent or causing a major orogeny or mountain building event could be by rifting, pulling apart, tearing apart a continent because hot spots begin to grow and tear apart a continent and open up an ocean. Usually it's a combination thereof. Um, could be another catastrophic event such as some kind of a major series of volcanism or we get smashed by some type of a meteorite. These are all reasons to conclude or begin a new segment of time on the time scale. Divisions are based in the Phanerozoic on Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. You read the time scale like the law of superposition. So Paleozoic would be the oldest. I need to point out that there's a few terms that would be valuable to you to recognize in your reading. When you're doing your reading in your textbook and other articles I'm going to have you look at, you will notice that there is a a series of terms used to describe which segment of a specific period or era we may be working in. For example, if it says lower or early, that refers to the beginning of a period. If it refers to upper or late, that refers to the end of a period. Sometimes there may be something called a middle. Obviously, that's the, the intermediate section of an era or a period. So in the realm of Phanerozoic, Phanerozoic Eon only makes up 12% of our time frame of the geologic time scale, but it also includes the most uh, record that we have of that time scale, so meaning the most thorough fossil record. So Paleozoic means early life uh, for Paleo, Meso means middle life, and Ceno means uh, recent life. Zoic refers to life forms. So let's talk in detail about the age of the invertebrates known as Paleozoic. Sometimes you'll actually hear it called the age of the fishes. That's actually denoted for a specific period within one of these uh, seven that we recognize in North America. Uh, the age of the invertebrates can be a bit misleading, thinking that that's all we had during the Paleozoic. Certainly not true. Even by the end of the first period of the Paleozoic, we had our first vertebrate. So uh, what we do see is a theme of simplistic life forms way down here, an explosion of life forms during the Cambrian of invertebrates. And then by the end of the Permian, we had very complex reptiles, but no dinosaurs. So a lot happens during the Paleozoic. Now, if you were in Europe, you'd only recognize six periods. Let me show you why. First of all, the uh, Paleozoic is divided into upper and lower. So lower, it constitutes at least um, early and late. Three periods. The early section is Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian. The late is Devonian. And if you're in Europe, Carboniferous and per Permian. But if you're in North America, the early is made up of Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian, which stays the same. And in North America, it would be Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian. So we have seven geologic periods as opposed to six uh, for Europe. 
We'll describe and explain why uh, when we get to Paleozoic in test number two. The Mesozoic is divided into three periods, and these periods are distinctive because of not just sea level rises and falls, but the evolution of new animals and organisms and orogenies that occur during this time. Climate changes also play a role in where these dividing markers are. So the oldest period is the Triassic, the middle period is the Jurassic, and the latest is the Cretaceous. A famous marker in the rock record stands right here at this marker between Cretaceous and Cenozoic aged rocks. Cretaceous is referred to as K, and you might have noticed on our time scale that you saw that there were abbreviations, and you've been given that information to learn these abbreviations and recognize them. The reason is the Cambrian already has um, a funny looking C, and then Carboniferous uses a C. So a different letter needed to be abbreviated for Cretaceous. So Cretaceous has the abbreviation of K. That's important to any areas in the United States that have Cretaceous rocks. And there are Cretaceous rocks all over the United States, so that's an important denotion to make. The Cenozoic is a little bit different in terms of how we operate it because there's so much controversy over this word right here, tertiary. When the initial thoughts of Lyell came out and he talked about the different types of four categories of rocks, tertiary was a term applied to rocks that were young. And we know that tertiary has a lot more specific uh, detail in the rock record about what life forms evolved. So let's look at the boundary marker down here and assume that tertiary is still in the time scale. While the International Stratigraphy of Commission now recognizes Paleogene and Neogene as the two periods that make up what used to be called tertiary, most literature in the world still recognizes tertiary, and here's why. This boundary marker right here represents one of the worst mass extinctions, certainly not the worst. In all fairness, it's the third worst, not the even the second. But it's the one that's most famous for uh, killing off non-avian dinosaurs, most of the marine reptiles, uh, a whole bunch of microscopic life in the ocean called foraminifera, and it also opened the door for mammals to fill the niches that previously that non-avian dinosaurs used to fill, which you would think of Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor and uh, Triceratops, animals that lived in the late Cretaceous. So uh, understand that this is an ongoing debate. Uh, I'm going to tell you that the tertiary is important that you recognize because most literature refers to the Cretaceous, meaning K, abbreviation to the T boundary. So it says KT boundary. Some newer literature now puts it as Paleogene. So it's um, PG uh, with a big T, uh, with a big, uh, it goes K. Some new literature now recognizes KPG for uh, Cretaceous Paleogene. So it is uh, an ongoing discussion. It kind of vascillates back and forth in the International uh, Commission of Stratigraphy. For so over this class, we're going to recognize tertiary as the period and paleogene and neogene as subperiods of the tertiary. The epic still stayed the same where they fall. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven epics that we currently have in the Quaternion. You notice I said currently. So that's uh, something to talk about here in just a minute. Each one of these periods is divided into epics. Important to recognize for the Cenozoic that every epic ends with a scene, C-E-N-E. Uh, the genes, uh, G-E-N-E's, are subperiods or periods, and then, uh, of course, the tertiary and quaternary were the original two periods assigned to the Cenozoic. So the Cenozoic era has a lot that happens during this time frame. So the Paleogene subperiod, which is part of the tertiary period, is made up of the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. I might point out that the worst wor world's worst global warming occurred right here. Uh, then we had a lot of volcanism right in this Oligocene epoch and some important plate movements which dictated a change in uh, needing to change epochs in terms of the climate shifts that occurred and changes in life forms. Hominids evolved during the Miocene. 
and we had lots of grasslands expanding here and then the climate started to really cool off by the Pliocene. So by the end of the Pliocene, really the true origins of the Ice Age began. The epic that holds the cards or the title for first place in Ice Age is Pleistocene and we'll be having a whole section on that. The Holocene is where we currently are. So the Cenozoic is referred to as the age of the mammals. So when you compare the age of the invertebrates, Paleozoic, to the age of the dinosaurs, which is really often called the age of the reptiles, and then certainly the age of the mammals of the Cenozoic, each one dominates in life form. So don't be deceived that during the uh, Mesozoic that we didn't have mammals, we did. Don't be deceived during the age of the mammals that we didn't have reptiles. We did. We just didn't have avian dinosaurs. And we still do have... Uh, don't be deceived that the Cenozoic era is missing reptiles because we certainly have those and we even have the remnants left over of non-avian dinosaurs referred to as avian dinosaurs. So you're looking at these fossils from the mammoth site in Waco, Texas, and those would be indicative of this epic right here. So while we recognize Ice Age animals very clearly, each one of these epics has something special to tell a story about. We have a pretty good rich fossil record because it's fairly new and hasn't had a chance to be destroyed. So there's more knowledge known about the Cenozoic than there is any other uh, era of geologic time and more discoveries happening on a regular basis. So we use colors to denote the maps for geology and those colors are set by the United States Geological Survey, which is what USGS stands for. And there are specific color schemes used for these maps. For Precambrian, uh, which is Archean, we use light shades of blue and gray to denote those colors. So if you see a map and these color schemes are used, you will know that it is Archean. And notice we use a big A for Archean as our abbreviation. So the Archean is put into the uh, Eoarchean, Paleoarchean, Mesoarchean, and then Neoarchean. So we pretty much use the same schematics of Paleo, Meso, and Neo. Neo is another term for Ceno, meaning new or our newest, and uh, Eo refers to very, very ancient. When we look at Proterozoic, these are done in some shades of browns and uh, and kind of pinky color. So we use olive brown, olive gray, olive blues, and reddish olives. These are the colors that denote uh, Proterozoic in age. And Proterozoic is done with a funny shaped P, and there's a good reason for that because there are a number of different P starting periods uh, on the time scale and epics. For the Paleozoic era, we use a series of purples, blues, and browns to denote this particular uh, period. Cameron is done in a reddish brown like you see in these colors right here. And believe it or not, the USGS has percentages of what colors, if you're blending and making your own map, of what should be uh, in each color schematic so you come up with the right color to denote your map when you make it. Subdued reds, I call them more pink, but they're uh, Ordovician. Reddish purple, that just looks like purple to me, but I guess if you add enough red, that's what it'll be, is Silurian aged rock. If you see this grayish purple here, which I kind of buy off on, that's going to be Devonian aged rocks. If you see bluish purple, looks like a real blue to me, that's uh, going to be Mississippian, and you get hints of red in here, which looks like true uh, true blue to me, but uh, when you make colors, my husband's a an artist, it really does matter what percentage of which primary colors you mix to make uh, the end result color. And so these would be your Pennsylvanian rocks right here. Permians are done in distinctive blues. So if you see blues or purples, bottom lines and pinks, you're looking at came, you're looking at Paleozoic aged rocks, and that's a standard schematic on any geologic time scale or geologic map. For Mesozoic, we use uh, combinations of greens to denote Mesozoic aged rocks. So uh, Triassic is done in a blue green color, while Mesozoic is done in true greens, and then kind of olivey greens and yellowish greens made up for Mesozoic uh, type of rocks for Cretaceous. 
So uh, since there's so much Cretaceous rock where the interior western or where the western interior Cretaceous seaway existed, you will see a lot of these aged rocks, not to mean not to mention terrestrial rocks for the land that was adjacent to the western interior seaway uh, that formed during the Cretaceous period. Now, when you look at tertiary and quaternary, remember tertiary is subdivided into paleogene and neogene, you will find oranges, yellow, orange, tan, and brown, different colors of brown than what we saw earlier that are denoted for tertiary aged rocks. Quaternary is distinctive yellow and even sometimes denoted as white. So uh, you will find these, uh, since they're so close in age, they're typically done in the same color, but they have a different color schematic than what you would see for paleogene, neogene, aka known as tertiary aged rocks. So there may be a new period assigned. Uh, we're at the Glen uh, Canyon Dam in Page, Arizona in this picture having field course. And as we're there, something too important to note, uh, human impact was a big deal in this canyon in particular because it tamed the mighty Colorado River. This is just one example of why we might need a new period called Anthropocene. First of all, anthro means human. So we'll be referring to that term several times throughout the sem semester in terms of what anthro means in terms of uh, climate change because anthropogenic refers to climate change induced by humans. So a Dutch chemist that was an atmospheric climatologist proposed in the year 2000 uh, that we needed a new geologic uh, epoch or period referred to as the Anthropocene. Since all our epochs are done with the word scene, this would be recognized as a new epoch of the Cenozoic. And he said it was merited based on data that suggested we have a climate change and potentially a sixth math ex uh, mass extinction. So what's the justification for the Anthropocene? This is the actual Glen Canyon uh, dam right here. He uh, suggested that substantial increases in soil erosion, greenhouse gases, acid rain, climate warming, uh, sea level rises, toxic chemicals to the environment that have been dumped had led to the following. Uh, one was an obvious human population increase because we're over 7 billion people now and headed on our way to 8 billion. Since we started burning significant fossil fuels with the Industrial Revolution, that that has changed the concentration of greenhouse gases in our climate, which has led to a climate shift of warming because we're holding uh, more heat in that part of the atmosphere than we're reflecting back to space. We cleared a lot of land for agriculture, which has ex uh, accentuated the climate change because it's changed the color of the earth, meaning it's albedo. So we're again absorbing more heat than we're reflecting. The growth of cities and power plants like this one is actually a hydropower dam, and that's why we take a tour of it on field course. These have interrupted the natural cycle of uh, erosion, of deposition, of life, and so forth. So is there going to be an Anthropocene? Hard to say, but you should be aware that this exists. Since most of human influences occur on land where erosion occurs, most will leave minimal traces in the rock record where we're really going to see the impacts and justification for making a new epic will be in a couple of places. The pollen record. You might go, really? <laughs> Any kind of plants and animals that are flowering plants that leave uh, pollen behind will give us an excellent record of changes and stresses environmentally that they experience. Ice core data is probably the best because it encapsulizes and permanently records until that ice melts, even air molecules. So the ice core record is very valuable to us. Acidity changes in the ocean impact, and we can witness and document this in studies happening today, coral reefs and other types of carbonate uh, structures. So the bad news is this. Carbonate rock is what absorbs carbon out of the ocean. It's the ocean's natural way of re regulating climate. So you remove that carbon into that rock. When it becomes acidic, the carbon gets released. So there becomes a point in the ocean's chemistry where the ocean will get back what it's been storing and that will put a flux of carbon back into the atmosphere. 
that's bad news. And we'll get to why when we get to the Eocene epic in uh, the tertiary period, because we'll be talking about the PETM, which stands for Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. So if adopted, when will it start? This is a controversy that no one agrees on yet. Some scientists vote for it to have started about 8,000 years ago due to the rise of farming, land clearing, soil erosion, and increased human population. However, other scientists vote for it when we see a distinctive change in chemistry of our atmosphere uh, during the Industrial Revolution. So you put that back several hundred years, maybe even 250 years or so. Right now, human impact is still included as part of the Holocene epoch. We don't know if this Anthropocene will be accepted. Some interesting developments have happened in this area. The Geological Society of America, known as GSA, entitled their 2011 meeting as Archean to Anthropocene. The past is the key to the future. Isn't that an interesting twist? Because usually it's the, the present is the key to the past. So in other words, we're saying what we see in the geologic record could be a clue what's going to happen in the future with melting ice caps and so forth, like we saw in different segments of geologic time, or you will see in this course. In 2015, 26 of the 38 members of the International Anthropocene Working Group published a paper suggesting that July 16, 1945, go figure that date, right? Kind of random date. This should be the date of the new epic where it begins. The minority thinks that 1610, which would be about the Industrial Revolutionary uh, point marker, or 1964, where we saw a massive growth in population change, as well as greenhouse gases, uh, should be the marker of the beginning of the Anthropocene. A future meetings will discuss what the definition of an epic should be, and if the Anthropocene justifies meeting that definition. So there'll be more to come on Anthropocene and whether or not it gets added to the geologic time scale when its start date actually occurs. So let's quickly look at a case study of wrapping this together and applying what you know. When we read the time scale, the Grand Canyon is probably the best place in the world that encapsulates the essence of understanding that the rocks tell a story. You can find layers at the bottom of the canyon that tell of this magnificent mountain building event during Rodenia, which was the first supercontinent of the Earth's history. After that, you see a story of sea level rise and falls, and you see times of Aeolian deserts, you see times of swamp conditions, you see times of fluvial deposition, and then even most recently, volcanism. But you see a pattern of changing climate, changing uh, depositional environments for this area. And it reads like a book. And that's what geology is designed to do. It provides clues. So you always read the book of geology from the bottom up. Remember, the law of superposition applies. Each layer represents a clue at a different chapter of time, which is used in terms of periods, sometimes even eons, when you're referring to the stuff at the very bottom. It tells a relative story, but we've been able to age date it using fossils and other types of uh, specific rocks to help us uh, narrow the story down. Each story is a different chapter of depositional environment changes. At the bottom, though, between these rocks that make up the gorge where the actual Colorado River is today and the flat rocks directly above it, tells one of the most magnificent, magnificent stories of geologic time. We're missing 1.2 billion years of time there. And so that's a massive erosion of a giant mountain range, probably very similar to Himalaya back when it formed. This is called the Great Unconformity. It's a, a very important chapter of the Grand Canyon story. So remember, the bottom layer tells us about the big mountain building event of Rodenia, and the layers above it tell us the more modern story of the Phanerozoic. But it caps off as being modern in terms of where you would go stand on the rims at the... Uh, North and South Rim Visitor Center is Permian in age. If you go to the west entrance, you can actually see some lava flows that are Cenozoic in age, but you're not going to see those at the North and South Rims. And the South Rim is where like 90% of visitors go, only 10% ever make it to the North Rim. 
So the layers directly above the great unconformity are the Cambrian set of layers that tell the story of a sea level rise where the sea came into the continent for the first time and deposited ocean rocks known as the Tapete Sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, and the Mauve Limestone. The layers above that, such as the Red Wall of the uh, Mississippian, which you'll learn about Red Wall Limestone, tells a story of a massive ocean that covered Arizona. We have shoreline property in Arizona documented in the Grand Canyon. It's pretty neat. So when you start to look at the story, you read it with a different pair of eyes after you've taken this course because the history comes to life based on what the, the clues of the rocks say. So hopefully you've uh, gained some insight as how the geologic time scale works. And you can read the layers of the Grand Canyon like a book. So other clues are in the canyon walls. That's for you to discover, to get out there and look at it. There are other clues in the regular rocks where you live. And every geology story has these same kind of clues. It's just the Grand Canyon is the poster child of being one of the best in the world to study. Remember, fossils are important to this equation. We'll be studying fossils as well in these lessons. And most importantly, using the comprehensive clues as a set instead of one individually is helps you read the book like it's supposed to, to be read with a comprehensive story in mind. It's going to be a concluding point for this particular lesson on the geologic time scale. Join me next time for our next lecture series and glad you were here. See you at the next stop. Bye.